So the challenge is not outstanding. You could see some people going through the full program under the West Africa. And it's reflecting now even in the Ghana College, which is, which is good. So I think it will get better and better. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's, so we're hearing something about the high level. So do you want to add something about the good things about supervised relationship. Okay, so um, from my own experience, uh, initially I had a topic for my dissertation which was suggested by my supervisor. And as I went along, I really felt that this wasn't a good research topic. But I found it difficult to express that because, you know, but I had to go away for a while. And when I came back, by the time I came back, I had a clear research interest myself. So I initiated and was proactive with that. It was still the same supervisor, but it was so much lighter because I had the interest and could take. So what I learned from that is that um, when the student has an interest themselves, it makes the relationship better because even if you somewhere along the way think I want to modify what I have brought up, you don't feel like you're going to offend your supervisor or so so you're already open and it makes the relationship better. Yeah, thank you. It builds on the first comment that we had about creating a really good relationship with the supervisor. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yes, what made my relationship work well with my supervisor was uh, I felt that the supervisor had a genuine desire for me to do well on my research topic. And so um, she always gave me positive feedback first, you know, anytime she reviewed my work and then made suggestions for improvement. And also, in addition, instead of she recommended another person who was an expert in that area to assist me towards the end, just to make sure, because she knew her limitations and didn't just restrict it to her. So, thank you. Excellent. That sounds like a great supervisor that you had. Yeah. Anything to add? Yes? I think that the supervisor was very useful in guiding the rules and regulations concerning the dissertation. But sometimes you know your work, you know how to present it, but you have to present it according to the institution's regulations. And they were very useful in guiding us in doing that. Yep, keeping you on track and making sure you don't fall foul of actually what's required. Yep. Did you, was there something to add on this table? Yep. Well, we just discussed the issues together, so I'll just pull together what we discussed. Okay. Okay, so we had um, very good supervisors, and I think one of the key things we raised was mentorship. I mean, our supervisors, very good mentors, and they also had a listening ear. So you'd go to them, and they'll sit with you and listen carefully to the arguments being raised, and then they come up with their the ideas. So I think that really helped. They were also very experienced, dedicated, and committed. I think that's briefly what I'll add. Excellent. Thank you. So it sounds like you've got a great pool of supervisors um, for many of you. Um, so I don't know, do you want to summarise where we've got to from your sheet? Because I'm sure at the back you can't read that. We've got to get here so that we capture it. But, yeah. So this is what worked well in the relationship with our uh, supervisors. Um, so, the supervisor quality, approachable supervisor um, is there, and the supervisor experience also, quite familiar with the um, format of the research you are doing, and so he's able to explain that to you. Um, in one instance, there's already a good relationship. I'm sure that will feed it to private wife, approachable, that was written there. Good relationship with the supervisor, but the individual student effort that's a good thing. Okay, you can tell that one with the student's own interest as a motivation that is important. Um, and uh, also, the, based upon the experience of the, of the supervisor, 
was able to uh, lead you to uh, extra links, very uh, good resource links that will help you to understand the project you did. And the supervisor who also gives a very um, uh, pressure in a positive sense. And so we'll be getting to you as a very happy rate, positive pressure for the supervisor. It all boils down to the qualities of the supervisor also. Uh, so appropriate feedback. And uh, when you also have a wide range of people who can guide you, not only be just looking beyond your supervisor, that uh, other people were also the experienced people you also learn from the experience. And um, of course, uh, mentorship has also come in. Uh, it also boils down to the quality of the supervisor. You have a listening ear, somebody have a listening ear, and mentorship a quite long relationship. And so these are the things that I'm captured from the things you said. All these things are the positive aspect, the things that work well in the relationship with the supervisors. So the second one we have, what we have just have, we are going to do will be um, suggestions of ways you can improve the relationship. All these good things notwithstanding, what do you recommend that probably will happen? So I'm going to come back round again with the mic. Thank you. Um, we captured that. Yeah, we've discussed it, but we haven't fed back yet. You've discussed the difficulties too, so should we start at the front this time? So, so we're focusing on the challenges and the problems now. Uh, some of the challenges that on our table were discussed was that the some of the supervisors actually didn't know much about computer. Okay, so most of the time you have to be physically present for feedback, or you have to print your way, you have to give a, a, a hard copy to the supervisor when he finishes the review, you go for it and all. So if your supervisor travels, means that you'll be stuck. Okay. So this is, some of, this is one of the main problems that was identified on our table. <laughs> even, even now, in this day and age, or was that from a long time ago? Is it a current, a current problem? Yes. <laughs> I, I see lots of nods around, so I presume it's a current problem for many. Thank you. Um, I think responding on time, sometimes um, you have to wait long. Responding on time, playing, giving feedback on what you've submitted. Yes. I think it's not so much being not being computer literate, but sometimes it's easier when you have that hard copy to flip back and through and put you know, corrections on it sometimes. You know, not that you're not computer literate. Anyway, anyway, anyway. <laughs> Uh, not having time. 
also from the world you like in one day to that point. So I guess at some point it's that you must learn to see the work. <laughs> Supervisor overload and supervisors not taking on too much work. Yes. Okay. I also think if the supervisor gets involved from the word go, so maybe getting them maybe to help you choose your topic, etc. Because then they are in on the word go. Rather than you writing a proposal and then approaching for them to have a look at it. So it becomes a bit more Yeah, so good engagement and participatory development of the proposal. Yeah. Anything new from this side? It covered. Um, yeah, I think we, we discussed the fact that what could um, in, improve the relationship would have been more regular one-on-one -on -one with um, our supervisors. And also, um, well, at the postgraduate level, there is a perception by most students that when they are, they've gone through the rudiments of research, they should be equipped with the skills to carry out independent research so that um, things such as data analysis, using the various tools, data, SPSS, are things which they should be well abreast of. But um, sometimes you realize that supervisor is also handicapped and not, you know, forthcoming in recommending others who could guide you. Yeah. And I think this is where um, to have some proof. Okay, thank you. So we heard one of the good things was about the um, supervisor identifying other areas of expertise that could be brought in to help. So if they don't do that, that's obviously a problem. Was there, there was another comment here. Yeah. Uh, when you have more than one supervisor and then uh, they don't agree, <laughs> that one yes. creates a lot of challenges. So the student having to manage differing opinions from different supervisors. Yeah, that is a really difficult problem. And actually I do warn my students, my PhD students, when they first arrive, I say, you know, you're a mature student, you've got two supervisors and you'll have other expert opinion coming in and it's up to you to decide how to manage your supervisors. Because part of the learning experience of doing research is that there are differing views out there. And part of the experience that they have to get is how to weigh up different views and, and make a decision about which way to go. And usually I leave them to struggle for a little bit and see if they can manage, but obviously you're there to support and try and help them move forward. But it is part of the learning process that you, they shouldn't be spoon-fed. And I think particularly at this level where they're quite senior, they should be able to manage different views, but obviously it can get to the extreme where there's complete log jam between two supervisors and then you do have to sort it out. Yeah, it is important though. Samson, summary Samson. So, on, add on. Oh, let's use the mic. Thank you. So, so when that happens, when there's a log jam, I mean, some supervisors take offense if you don't. Um, accept what they have decided and what they, yeah, and then you decide. Would it be advisable for the two, maybe the two supervisors to meet? Yes. And decide what the way forward for the student, because the student is yeah. put in a difficult yeah, situation. And hopefully the student would instigate that and say, can we all sit down together and try and sort this out? Yeah. yeah. So, reflecting on our own interactions, what could have improved? Uh, of course, the first uh, one, uh, uh, that's for it. Our apologies. The very, very experienced, old yet very experienced uh, as well says, when the computer editorate, uh, you need to be physically, you know, see, I mean, present for feedback. Whether the person had um, computer literacy, you could just give you feedback on online or something. Uh, that impaired feedback. And um, some of them also will delay in giving you the feedback. Um, uh, lack of time, uh, quality time of interaction, and uh, not involving the supervisor early in the project. You do your own thing before you just 
uh, send it to him to sign for you, the student sign for you. And um, sometimes the supervisor is also too much engaged in many, many other things and goes down to not having a quality time um, to sit with you. And, uh, and so more frequent interactions is advocated. And of course, uh, sometimes to the so wise may not be adequately um, knowledgeable in the area. Um, that is also a problem. You said something, I couldn't uh, uh, hear what you said. Supervisors are conflicting. Okay, that is beyond you. You are for this. So these are the things you put out there, but we have conflicting thoughts uh, or feedback from these supervisors. So these are the things that we put out there. What we put. Okay. So now we're going to cover the last bit, but again, we're trying to think about the student's perspective. So from the student's perspective, what are the sort of things that we've learned from this discussion that we could tell the students up front that would try and make their lives easier? Can, can I just ask, is there a student handbook or a resident's handbook for their roles and responsibilities when they do their projects? Do they get any something formal or is it just left to the supervisor to talk to them? Is, is there something on the website? Okay, table is I think that the guidelines for writing a proposal are clearly spelled out and also for the dissertation. But what to do between um, a student or a resident and the supervisor, they have not really been written out. Okay. For example, are there guidelines to, if you send a document to your supervisor, it should return to you in two weeks. There's nothing like that. But okay. there is an, an arrangement that the head of the department where you're training would sort of be the one to guide the process. But there's nothing written down to tell the head of the department you have to do this, you have to do that, you cannot do this, there's nothing like that. Okay, but it's helpful to know that, but potentially that could lead to some problems if the expectations of the supervisor and the student are very different and there's nothing to refer back to. So one of the things that we did for the DPDM Quite early on we realised it was really helpful to have a student handbook. So there was a facilitator, supervisor's handbook and a student handbook. And a lot of it was the same in both, but they were just written from slightly different perspectives so that it was clear what the expectations were. Obviously it wasn't always met and there were often difficulties, but some, some, I don't know from your experience, did it, do you think the, super, the student handbook Helped. Yes, yes, yes. For the DPDM, so I think that's quite similar to what uh, Lawson said, that we go to college, the guidelines for the proposal is written there. But sometimes it's interesting that people are not even familiar with it. The DPDM, there's a clear guideline that breaks everything. If you are marking what constitutes a phase, it's very detailed, it's very useful. Very useful. So definitely it should be about once you are doing the research, as they have said right, so it can be very, very useful. Yeah. Very and I think it's, yeah, and it's separate from the regulations of the college, which is like what should go in the proposal, what should go in the dissertation. It's more about the relationship between the supervisor and the student and what is expected of each. We could probably include in there what would improve the focus. That, that people should familiar, not only the supervisor, but the students themselves. Because it's interesting to note that students are doing research, they don't even know the format and the guidelines, and they say they are doing research. So they will need to really read and understand it. If there's an aspect that they cannot, they don't understand, that is when you can actually seek explanation. And sometimes even the supervisor, certain areas may not be very clear. So we get to either the college or something. So I think, so I think people being familiar with the guidelines are also very key. Yeah. Very and I think it's it's more than just the college regulations and what goes in the assignments. It's it's a lot of it's about you know 
how often are you expected to meet with your supervisor? What do you do at the start-up of a project? It's those sorts of things that aren't written in college regulations that are, that are really quite helpful. Okay. So now what we want to hear is about what, what from the student's perspective, are the sort of lessons from what, what we've heard of all your experiences as students, what are the lessons that we can learn, that we can apply as we go forward? Just some key lessons. Let's have about four key lessons. So you want maybe we should set time aside specifically, dedicated time, maybe once a week or once a week, that they know that time they can come and discuss with us. Okay, so, so fixing regular meetings at fixed times and it might be that at the beginning you need them weekly because they're starting up and they're not sure and once they get going and they're more confident you don't need them as often but at least they should be fixed. Yeah. Another lesson that we've learnt. Well, um, I, I understood the question or we understood the question to be um, being a student before and now um, a supervisor. Okay. What have you learned from being a student exactly. and now you're a supervisor? Okay. So um, we look at it being that as a supervisor now you should um, think that you've been a student before. So when your student comes to you with the proposal or whatever and you're looking at it, see it as you've been there before yeah. so that you think like a student and behave like a student so that you can communicate well with the student and help the student with whatever you brought and then um, we also learned that the work your students do represents you yes that's a very good point. yes yeah. um, so whatever your student is presenting out there your name is there so your um, integrity is at stake, is on, the, on that paper. So if your student send out a bad paper, your name is there and it represents you. Uh -huh. So we also learned that as supervisors now, we should think that whatever is going out from my student is me going out. And with that, we can have that kind of um, mind shift to help the student to do the work well. Yes, and also help in building um, this work capacity. Yes, uh -huh. and then also build a personal relationship with the student so that sometimes you, the student is going through some family or personal issues that is not letting him or her do what you have asked him to do. I think it's better also to go into that so that you can help him out or give him solutions to guide him or her to get come out so that you can help him bring out a good people. Yeah. I can see this group was extremely empathetic towards the student's perspective. Keep putting themselves in the student's shoes. It's really important, and it's actually quite difficult. The further away you get from having been a student, and the more you move around in the high circles, sitting on all sorts of committees and things, the harder it is to, to rethink how it was when you were a student. And it's tough. The first time you do research, it's so confusing. Yeah. Yes? We also discussed and said that we should set targets. So both supervisor and the student should agree on setting targets with timelines so that we achieve those targets. Yeah. So as well as these regular meetings, there should be some targets. Yeah. Which helps both. Everybody has the expectation there. Yeah. I think a very first meeting with the student as supervisor is very important, where you all start from the same level, so you know why you are there, what is expected of everybody, and all agree before you start. Because if you do that, then you can stick to your timelines, you can, so that it's not just a degree, do research for just a degree, but for further development. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any additional learning points?
I'm sure more might come out over the morning, but do you want to just summarise? Uh, so, once again, the guidelines, if it is a Ghana Cali guidelines, if it is West Africa guidelines, you have to be familiar with it. It's a very common error that people do. They don't pay attention to details. So let us also help uh, in that, that uh, they must get it, read it themselves. And um, the fact that um, we have been there before, we are all one student, so the students will have, without a word, empathy that we need to. Uh, put them. I wasn't so sure. Uh, but let's say uh, uh, empathize with the students. I've been there before. But the key thing is that uh, your integrity, you are going to sign it like somebody said, uh, as the uh, director said at the beginning, you review somebody's uh, project and there's someone to buy. That's the thing the integrity. And so, writers are not happy about that. So, I think all of that must all drive for quality. Your integrity is a thing. And uh, we have, so the students may not be performing because they are. They say if you put something not coming, where check up at the top. Okay, if you are pulling the thing not coming, something holding it. Interesting. So um, just review the student holistically. Uh, if you are the supervisor, if there are things that we think are a uh, challenge to the person because of family issues or other non-academic or professional design, that will also uh, be helpful. So identify challenges that the student they face. And this timeline and, and the targets, very, very important. That is what we have talked about. There. I think you said this at the beginning, the interaction. Okay, you said this uh, so that you will actually uh, go by them. That would be very helpful. At least, even if you miss one time, with all the timeline there, you will find a, a way of trying to uh, make up for that. But if there is no uh, timeline, then you just allow the person that when you are done, you come to me and things like that. Then you see that they will delay, delay, delay. We also advise them. You see that they will delay. You know that the deadline is two weeks away. I mean, they have to provide that. And the night before, because you need your signature. And this has been a major program that we face. At the court of examiners meeting here, and also in Uber, that we go there, people complain. And if you say, I won't sign, you know our relationship is you are a very wicked man. You don't want to be. You understand? This is uh, uh, actually. Point out later we have for the next meeting discussing our little presentation. And we don't get to have a great time to interact with the students. But I think if you set the timelines, then we agree to them. It will go a very long way for you to do a critical review of your work so that you're happy to sign. But what happens is that the night before, then the deadline is they sign. Sometimes they do bring only the signature, a page. That's what they do. Signature page. That's the man. You don't have to finish typing the thing. You sign, then you can go and that great. That's the problem you're facing. But if you are very tough, you say, no, I won't do that. You say, ah, you don't want to do this. They must understand these things that we want to help them. So I like the timeline. Very, very critical. I think we need to set it at the beginning and make sure that uh, we are great with it. Can you want to say something else? I just wanted to add that, yes, it's, it's good to have those timelines set and scheduled very well, but we also need to build trust and be honest about it in such a way that if you are meeting the candidate or the, the student weekly, don't wait. Then tomorrow is the meeting, then you are skimming through the work and, and you are missing things, and then you come there and you can actually offer very good, useful. It discourages the, 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 the student. So if you have to reschedule it, reschedule it. Say, I didn't have time to look at it. I need to look at it again. And then it works better that way. So that's a commitment from the supervisor himself. That also commit to the agreed targets. Commitment. And so if we are giving the book to you, uh, let us commit ourselves to look at it. And uh, uh, he, uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That's, it's quite a lot of hard work trying to put yourself in the students' feet, particularly if it was a long time ago for you.
I don't know how, how this will work. Maybe in the past it wasn't easy, but now that we are getting more and more fellows, uh, supervisors not taking on more students than they can handle. But in the past, it, you did have to do it because there were very few, and so if you didn't accept someone, then it's like, where do they go? And inherently with that, it did bring some delays. So as our numbers increase, we should be honest with ourselves, look at our shadows, and not take on more students than we can supervise well. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can see that there was a problem in capacity, you know, a few years ago, yeah. when there were not enough specialty supervisors in certain areas, and inevitably those supervisors would get overloaded. And I think it was a real credit to the people who were trying to bring on the more junior staff at that time, but they really committed and overcommitted themselves to try and get this cohort through. But, and, it, and it was a difficult time, and I think there was a time when it, that was inevitable, and I think those people made a big sacrifice to try and supervise those students and get them through. And the students may have not had such a good quality experience because supervisors were overloaded, but I think you're right. I think that now, you know, there's so much expertise across Ghana in the clinical fields in research that there's not really an excuse for supervisors to get overloaded anymore. And the quality will inevitably go up. Yeah, yeah. yeah I want to suggest, I think, uh, Henry, you are here. Uh, you know, how they are, uh, supervisors are assigned, we need to look at that also. Okay, sitting there, yes, we know the expertise, that this person, this is the area of people. But I think if we can probably check with the person's availability first, okay, before the book is assigned to the person. Because sometimes you are not aware of this, we come on your table, then there are three um, uh, 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 proposals lying on your table to, to redeem. And you may have it. And you see, when the thing has come to you, not like a donor, you know, if it's like you are going to review a donor, they always give you a link. I will, I will review it and we can decline. Here you don't get any opportunity like that. So the thing is posted, you come into your team. And we find it very difficult to say, post it back because I'm too tight. So I think those who do the assignment of the, uh, assigning the various work, they must check. And now we have our email, we have our phone numbers, that we have this uh, uh, work for you. Do you think it will be available to get complete views? Please, let us consider that. Because it's difficult to say, the means, one of the things we don't do well, some white man will say that we don't know how to say no. When you go at the thing, you can't do the thing, you can't do it. You can't do it. It's not saying, sorry, I can't do it. And you will say that. Yes. <laughs> if somebody in the rest center will say, that's not the problem you are seeing in Ghana, you can't say no. Okay, so let's consider that, how we, we um, uh, share these things. I don't know if you want to say something about how the supervisors were allocated and chosen. Would that, would that be helpful? Well, unfortunately, it is not the college's responsibility. It is the faculty chair that will inform the college that sent the book to Professor Angie. So some of them are here. Maybe they are taking notes so that they at least check for the availability and the possibility. Because even a journal, they'll send it to you. Can you review it? If you can, you click yes. If you can't, you click no. And so we should give the supervisors that, that opportunity. The other thing we find is within the faculties, there are some people who are very good. You send them the book, within two, three weeks, you'll get it back. So they tend to be overused. Because there are others that you send to them three months. We have some six months. You haven't heard anything from the person. You say they have not seen it. You send it back. Another six weeks, you still haven't heard. So then the faculty chair tends to lean towards the reliable uh, once then the person becomes overburdened. But I think that uh, if they do a lot of work on their side, it will be easier on us. Thank you. Uh, so when I said the colleague, I, I, I know that it's done by the various faculty, but at least I'm putting across there so that you have a chat with the various uh, faculty chairs. Uh, because eventually anybody in a faculty have the person from our email. Just a thing that you have with a very good person. So those are things I added. So commitment on part of the to make sure that they really uh, review the work. 
And if you think you need to reschedule an appointment, I do that. And I advise them not to overbed And I remember in Kumasi, when this DPDM started, you know, you got to get a lot of people. That was the main decision. That's why I do. It helped me to get my fellowship at that time. And we had only back one. Yeah. And the only fellow there. And we pitched that uh, old man. Everybody's research. And we go to his house. The wife accommodated us. But the last time we came to my office, they thought, look at what we have done. Now we got about 13 fellows of so That's the way So initially, of course. It was and now we've got a lot of people. So it was great. And that's why this idea of sometimes secondary supervisors are also important. So that we give two people. The younger one, they even have more time to look at it. And then the experienced person can just run through and just look at it. Yeah. It was really, t I mean, I, I really appreciate what you were saying about, you know, being overloaded at, at the beginning when, when the whole process was starting. Because when we set this up in Kumasi in 2002, there was, it was only about a woman, yeah. And, um, and he couldn't, you know, he was busy anyway. So it, what happened in the end was I was coming three times a year to run workshops, and there was a lot of self-learning and a lot of, I mean, Samson was one of those yeah, key founder yeah. members. And we just started with five people because that was all I could manage trying to do this virtually at distance. And then we got them to do that. And they had to do their data collection with virtually nobody there to help them supervise. And I was doing it all by email yeah. and distance. It was, it was very difficult and I do appreciate it. But because you see the vision, you can see that if you build a cohort, then the very next year they were coming back teaching the next cohort and the next one and then it moved down to Accra as well and then, you know, then it's sort of life of its own. But, but it, it's tough, so I appreciate that. Okay, so, just to give you a little bit of a break, um, these are some of the things that we have in student handbooks. And it's just a bit of general guidance for the students so that they know what to do and, and things that, that they need to think about. So there are reciprocal things in the supervisor's handbook. But the first thing that we say to them, and I was really pleased to hear it was the very first thing that you said as well, was that you need to form a relationship with the supervisor based on honesty and mutual understanding and mutual respect for where each person's coming from. We know that our students go touting around and they talk to each other and they say, is this a good supervisor and do they give feedback quickly and are they thoughtful and do they make time? So we know that supervisors get a reputation amongst the student body. So it, it might not be so critical now when, when supervisors are in short supply, but once they get to be quite a lot of supervisors, it becomes clear who are, who are popular supervisors with the students and why. And also some students, like, we haven't really talked about the sort of characteristics of how students like to be supervised, and obviously everybody's different, and it takes quite a while, it takes me about three to four months to work out whether the student is somebody that wants a lot of reassurance and is not very confident and might need micro helping in the beginning, or whether they are the sort of student that you need to leave alone in the beginning and just let them go do their thing and then rein them in when you see when they're going wrong. And there's every type of student in between. And it takes quite a lot of skill in the supervisor to be able to quickly realise what sort of student they've got. Because they need different things. So the ones that I realise are struggling quite a lot early on, I might see them twice a week for half an hour and go minutely through every single activity that they've done that week and plan for the next meeting. And those that actually like to work much more independently, I give them a list of things that they need to do and they come back and report in a couple of weeks and they may not have done them very well, in which case I then have to go back and do a bit more of the micro stuff. But each student you have to tailor very, very intensively. You have to understand about the student's needs very quickly because they can't necessarily articulate what it is that they need because they've never done this before, so they don't know. Um, 
The other thing is about establishing the frequency and timing of meetings, which I think we've all discussed, but it's important to stress to the student how, how they need to stick to this timetable. And actually, when I say that, what I always do in the first meeting with a student is ask them to write their own timetable. It's not me imposing a timetable on them. They have to have ownership of this timetable. They know their social circumstances and their workload. They're the ones that can work out where the deadlines are. It means they need to get to grips with the college regulations because in their time, I get them to write a proper Gantt chart. So they produce a Gantt chart on day one at the first meeting and it has in it the fixed time point. It's like when something must be submitted. And then I get them to work backwards so before that submission, when is the draft, final draft? And then when is the earlier draft coming? And through each meeting, I get them to expand that timetable and make it more and more detailed so that we can review the, the next few weeks with the student and then we also know where we're going in the longer term. And it's owned and managed by the student. So that if they fall behind in some area, I get them to rewrite their time plan. It's not me imposing it on them. They decide what they can do and when and how. So the students need to understand also what they, what skills they need in order to be able to do research. You know, they don't know. They've not done this before, or, or they've had very little experience. So. Um, we'll come on to the sort of things that they might need, but that they may already come saying, I'm not very good at statistics, or I'm not a very good writer, I don't know how to do a literature review. So part of your role is then to try and help them find those skills. Framing the project is a bit um, about what we heard earlier, about what is the topic, what are the objectives, how does it fit within departmental important areas, What's the purpose of doing this project? How is it the results going to be used later? It's more around, it's around those big generalities at the first meeting. And then these deadlines are fixed. If you become known as a supervisor that lets students drift with their deadlines, it will become very problematic because the college does not move its deadlines for students. So you'll end up with a big crunch at the end, or they won't be able to submit on time. So when you work out the time plan, it should be very carefully sequenced so that they get everything in on time. The students also need to be aware that the part of their expectation should be that they will get feedback that they don't necessarily like. And it's really important it's given to them in a constructive, positive way. And I was really pleased to hear somebody said the first thing to do is give them positive feedback first. You can always find something good about what they've done, always. So it's important to do that first, and then come on to the feedback about where they could improve and how and why. Because if you don't explain that, they won't learn going forward. And then the student needs to be able to take that on board, understand what it is that's required and come back with some improvements. But they need to know that that is going to happen. Even though it's obvious to us, they need to know to, to expect that to happen. And the other thing is that the, the students need to know how their progress will be reviewed. And that's why I find this idea of getting them to write their own time plan to be really helpful. Because in that time plan, it's clear when they've fallen behind or when they haven't. And for the student that says to you, I don't think I have made fast enough progress. Or I have a PhD student at the moment who's ahead of schedule. And she's coming to me saying, I've already done this and I've already done that. Do I have time? Can I write a paper in this three months where I've made some time? So it's the student that then owns the progress as well, so that they're not surprised when they come to you and you say, actually, you're falling behind. We need to find some way of improving it. It's actually the students know they have their time plan, which they drafted. So it, it helps the relationship between the student and the supervisor because there's nothing surprising coming for the students. They already know what's expected. 
um, and one of the other things is that, that, as we heard from the front table, that your integrity is attached to this student somehow, implicitly. I mean, we all know, we've all had students who are not great students. And, uh, you know, you're attached to them too, I'm afraid. So, uh, you know, if there's, there's some students that are just not made to do research and they just have to get through this process and, you know, they'll just be dragged, kicking and screaming to the end. Um, but for many of them, actually, research is life transforming. You know, if they have a good experience for their whole professional life, they start thinking differently. And you were their first key intensive supervisor, and you will be forever one of their lifelong mentors. I don't know, Samson, have you got experiences of your Samson, have you got experiences of your students? this a little bit, but they need a lot more guidance at the beginning 
than they do as they go through the process. And they should be encouraged to be much more independent towards the end. We're not trying to create research leaders. These are not necessarily, you know, my, only a tiny minority are really likely to go on to be core career researchers. But what you need them to do, because they're going to have to be supervisors in the future, is to encourage them to be a bit more independent as you go through the whole process. Obviously, the students, we've heard um, from, from you about some of the problems that might arise, and then what does the student do? So, again, this is taken from the student handbooks. This is advice to the students, just general advice, which says focus on the professional difficulties rather than the characteristics of the supervisor. So that means we encourage the students to think about what is the actual technical problem they've got with their research, rather than the fact that the supervisor never smiles, or you know the supervisor's fiddling with their phone, or you know it's we try and get them to focus on the actual problem that they've got with their research. We say go and talk to other students because once they, they realise that it's not just an easy ride, that all the students are having some sort of difficulties and it sort of gives them a norm reference that actually everybody has some problems and this isn't such a bad one. If there's a, a real problem then obviously we have a written process for students and how they should escalate their problems but the first step is to actually just go and discuss with the supervisor and then as a supervisor you need to know how to deal with various problems that the students might have it might be to do with their research, but it might be beyond that. It might be actually saying something to do with their social or personal life. And not that you, you know, you're not a counsellor or a social worker, but you need to understand how that's impinging on, on what they're trying to do. So these are the other things that we tell students, and I, uh, we have emphasised this quite a lot, so I won't spend too long on it. But we tell the student it's their responsibility to organise the meetings. So it's not you, the supervisor, that should be chasing the student. The student should be arranging the meeting at a time. And it can definitely be a virtual meeting. In this day and age, there's no reason why you shouldn't have a Skype or a WhatsApp or a, some other sort of meeting. That's perfectly fine if that's appropriate. Don't forget to record the discussion because there have been occasions where students have made formal complaints that supervisors haven't met or have taken too long or something, then you need the evidence there. Mm -hmm. And it also helps to look back when you're talking to the student, you can see how far they've come. So there are several reasons why it's important to actually document any discussions that you do have. And certainly for us, for PhD students, they cannot pass through at the end of each year without having a written record online of at least eight supervisory meetings face to face with their supervisor. So they can't progress at all, they just get blocked. The students need to be asked to prepare, you know, the, the onus is on them for running these meetings with the supervisor. It's not the supervisor that should be dictating this. Part of their training is that they must be able to do this. So they prepare some work for discussion at the meeting. It might be a small abstract, it might be a list of references, it might be a list of problems they want to discuss. But they need to do a bit of work in advance of the meeting. They, just, they shouldn't just pitch up and expect you to, to know what they require. It's important that the student is asked to summarise what have they done since our last meeting. So I'll say to them, okay, how have you been getting on at the last meeting? We said you'd do this, how has it gone? What's gone well? Have you got any problems? So that they get the chance then to give, tell you the good points as well as the problems which are going to come inevitably later. And then to um, think about this, ask the student, once the meeting is finished, that's not the end of their responsibility with respect to the meeting. 
So they really need to go think about the meeting. What did they learn? What did they do? How are they going to improve and change things for the next meeting? So that they need to, to be encouraged to do something straight after the meeting. That's the supervisor's role. It will be helpful so that uh, those who are doing the supervision, it will be taken as part of their work in the department yeah. so that they will be given time. Yeah. I I time for the work. supervision. Maybe somebody else can help answer the question. Uh, you must know that uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, for previous supervisors, I'm a senior colleague. You have to schedule this. 
it is a world round to you. I don't think I'm going to tell you uh, tell you the evidence. That there are many other times that we are not on spot, just doing something. The other is giving advice. And so it will be difficult because basically, the time we do for seniors is emergency duty. Otherwise, every day you come. I'm talking about that I'm ahead of time. You have to come, you have your own work you are doing. It's only the emergency duty that you are putting your name there that today you are going to emergency room for time. But for the time you do your own, that's your own day. So it will be difficult for actually to do that. Okay? But we emphasize that as a uh, senior person, or supervising students' work, it's important for your promotion. We are going to look for promotion, not only in academia, maybe in the Ministry of Health, we are going for this thing. How many people have you had to do after yourself? So we see it as part of the job we do. But to draw a time table and say that we are taking off because we are supervising students, it will be difficult. So basically, the time table I it's emergency, it's only the emergency room that I put your name there. That put in the, the rest is your own work around you. Have to do control. Yeah. Okay. So I don't have an answer for your question. I think it's a matter of negotiating with your with your line managers. So just finally in this session while we're still thinking about the students, these are the sorts of core skills that research students generally need, just generically. And I don't know where your residents get these skills from. Is there a, is there a course for them that, where they can pick up these skills? Or is it part of your job to find the skills for them somehow? Where do, where do your students get these sorts of skills? Because of the DPEDM that's here, they're supposed to all register and attend and do the DPDM. I presume that's where they, they taught all of this in the DPDM. I don't know. Okay. So, they, so they do that as a foundation. Yes. So, so it's only just started. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. I speak for uh, public health faculty. These are taught courses in, in, the, in the faculty. So the, uh, when the, the, the residents uh, register and they start the course, um, these are all embedded in the coursework that they do. also take advantage of online research courses. There's, a, there's so much stuff available online now where they can do these things. But what, I, what I'm trying to understand is that is it your, your, if your student comes without many of these skills, you're going to really struggle as a supervisor. You can't teach them each of these things individually. And if you're expected to get them through a research project, they need to have at least basics of these skills from somewhere else. So is this the is this the problem? It is a problem. Yes. Um, the college does organise a research methodology course for residents. Some of them, um, the reasons given actually they on two things. Most of them about improving clinical practice. Okay. So um, it's expressed very uh, vigorously that we do research to improve our chemical practice. So we have a uh, group of chemical services uh, to develop new ideas to improve chemical care as a topic, which of course if you improve chemical care and innovation, uh, type clinicians decide to do research and scale for part one. Um, so chemical practice as evidence-based medicine, that's all put up there. And then we have 
The others are talking about the scientific knowledge to address the knowledge gap to uh, further scientific knowledge among colleagues that we do that. Uh, academic progression um, is there. And, uh, <laughs> no, that's important. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, and also medicine dynamic and to network and identify new ways of doing things. Um, appropriate research question, to formulate appropriate research question, and uh, how to develop research methodology. So basically, um, these are the two key things. Doing research for the pure science that's to, uh, in academia, that's to progress, find solutions to that. But majority of you are saying that um, the end is also help us improve clinical care. Because the question has to be the population to improve clinical care. So these are the two major things that we what, what we could try and do, if it would help, um, because the, um, I know that the college wants to capture as much of this as possible, we could maybe photograph that. If we leave them up there, we could photograph it and then use it as a resource later. I don't know if that would help. Think about it. Okay, thank you. So, um, you'll remember that one of our objectives was to try and work out what the purpose of research training for clinicians. And I think it's not that every clinician is going to be a Nobel Prize winner. They're not all trying to get their papers in the New England Journal of Medicine. But the key message is that the reason why it's important for clinicians to understand research is that they, they begin to get a questioning mindset. They become curious. And they also get a mindset that enables them to start thinking about how to solve problems and to be critical about the evidence that they're seeing that might under, underlie guidelines or recommendations. So it, it advances medicine and makes care for the patient better at the end of the day, which is what we all want. So that's the prime reason that I think Samson has pointed out. Just come back from all your very helpful comments. And there are obviously other factors. You need to push forward the science. It might be that there's a burning question in your department about some problem that you keep seeing and you don't know much about it. So somebody can uncover some interesting things about that that will help the patient. And also, as Sam said, it's, it's important for your professional development mm -hmm. and your career and your CV that actually you do get involved in supervising students. And the fact that you're here today shows that what commitment you've got already to supervising students. So we're really happy to see you today. So we're going to move on to the next of the objectives. This is um, the outcome that we wanted referring to students. So we're going to think about the roles and responsibilities of the students. So I want you to just put yourself in a mindset of being a student doing your research. And I've used all the way through this, I've used the term student. I know that you know for you this is relevant to relevant to residents. But also you'll be supervising undergraduate students and master students and PhD students. So I've just used the generic term students, although we know that specifically this is related to the residents. So another chance for you to discuss with your team partner and I will give you a chance to go and talk to other people. So if you, if you get fed up talking to the same person, or you want to make some new friends, we'll mix you up a little bit later on. But what I want you to do is just to spend the next 10 minutes talking to your neighbour about your experience as a student. So when you were doing your very first piece of research, what worked well in your relationship with your supervisor? This is more about the supervisor-student relationship. It's not about, you know, the internet broke down or I lost my computer. It's about the supervision relationship with the student. So in terms of the way that your supervisor helped or didn't help, what worked well? And why do you think that worked well? So discuss that for a few minutes. 
And then what worked, what really didn't work very well? What could have been improved? Um, and what were the reasons for that? Because we want to learn from our own experiences. And as I said earlier, if we share all our experiences, we'll have a huge wealth of information. And then what have we learned that we could now apply in our own practice as a supervisor? So if you discuss those three in the next 10 minutes or so with your partners on the table, and then we'll ask you to give us some feedback and we'll come round with a microphone so that um, we can try and make sure that everybody can hear everything properly. Okay? So this will be individual experiences. Um, about 9.20 to probably 9.40.